Good evening, and welcome to the Failure Cabaret. We would like to take the time now to ask you to silence your phones. Taking pictures and videos during the performance is encouraged. We just ask that you tag at the Fremonts in anything you decide to post. And please, only post pictures or videos that make them look hot because they are super, super vain. And don't bother with TikTok because they are too old to give a shit about TikTok. And now, without further ado, please welcome the Fremonts. dress when I first met you and the sun made you light up like a fire we were gathered there to celebrate the love of our friends but I was the one I was the one who lived there inspired how often do you meet someone that you actually love never and every day how often do you meet someone that you actually love never and every day it was not the first time that I had felt true love It was like I knew you from another lifetime And you might have been, you might have been my daughter or my mom How often do you meet someone that you actually love? Never and every day How often do you meet someone that you actually love never and every day good evening and welcome to 54 below my name is justin badger and i grew up in fremont california this is Stephanie Dodd, and she grew up in Fremont, Nebraska. We are the Fremont. And we're here tonight to perform for you direct from the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. <laughs> Our show, The Failure Cabaret. Yes, an entire evening of us singing songs about all the ways that we fucked up. How often do you meet someone that you actually love? Never and every day. We are unknown and absolutely known. We are unknown and absolutely known. We are absolutely known we are unknown and absolutely known isn't this great <laughs> This is exactly how the theater is supposed to work. <laughs> you all paid money to see something and then you showed up to see it. Yes. Good job, you. Yeah. <laughs> and then we showed up to actually do the thing that you paid money to see. Good job, us. And even if you don't love it, you can't get your money back. It's too late. This is a splendid arrangement. <laughs> Speaking of splendid arrangements, we are only here tonight because we have a good friend who said a magical sentence to us that we had never heard before. He said, Said, I'm bored and I have too much money. And that friend is here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, our executive producer, advertising legend, Chuck Porter. Chuck, say hello to everybody.
And so we took Chuck's money and we used it to write this show. He is very disappointed and wishes he could get his money back. But he can't. It's too late. It's a splendid arrangement. When we sat down to write this show, we didn't have a lot of brilliant ideas. We didn't have a handful of bad ones. We had no ideas. But our friend, Chuck, with all of the money and nothing to do, said, write what you know. And we thought, well, we have been married for what feels like a very long time. Let's start there. We're gonna start with a little table of contents so you'll understand the long and desperate path of marital, personal, and professional failures we'll be discussing for the next three hours. <laughs> three hours? <laughs> we get kicked out of the space in exactly one hour. Ah, we'll do the festival-length version. Yes, we'll fail even faster than usual. Failure number one. We got married for terrible reasons. Failure number two. We went broke in New York City. Failure number three. We accidentally moved to Boulder, Colorado. Failure number four. We trashed our dreams of being artists and settled for office jobs. Failure number five. We didn't fit in in Boulder, like, at all. Failure number six. We forgot to have kids. But we do have a dog. And he's a total asshole. Failures seven, eight, nine. Yeah, things are going to get a little bit rocky there, folks, so you might want to brace yourselves. You know, if we're going to talk about all this, I might need a drink. Yeah, I may even need to take a time out at some point. We'll see how it goes. Let's just <laughs> take it from the top. Failure number one. <laughs> We met working as actors in New York City when we were cast in a play as husband and wife. The chemistry was instant. We were like a working class Ben and Jay Lo uh, Oh, no. Jennifer, Jennifer Affleck. Affleck. Yes, right, that's sorry. right, that's right. But I was already engaged to be married to a famous musician. And I was busy dating an endless string of women with no breaks in between relationships because I have trouble being alone. <laughs> My fiance, who uh, was a very famous musician, they got that part. had an idea it's for clear. a new show and he needed a lot of time to stay home and write it. So I paid the rent while he created and then his show went to Broadway and he dumped me. <laughs> I was very angry and very fragile. And I saw my opportunity. <laughs> Luckily, I had just ended my last tragic relationship and was desperately looking for something to fill the void. And that's how we first got together. Yeah, and after a few <laughs> years of carrying each other's emotional baggage, we finally got married for the best reason two New Yorkers ever could get married. Housing. housing. We were going to work at an international school in Switzerland one summer where they offered two housing options. A, stay in the dorm with an assigned roommate. Or B, live in the apartments for married people with a view of Lake Lugano. We swooned over the balconies. And the private bathrooms. And we said, we like this. Let's put a ring on this. We were married at the historic New York City courthouse on a rainy Tuesday and... It's been absolute bliss ever since. And if you believe that, you've probably never been married. <laughs> mm. Why the long face, is it that bad? Why did we think that this would be so easy? It was too late when they all said, Silly young thing, it's not as pretty as it seems. Walking down aisles, blind to the miles, prince queen, lie in the dark, re-watching, fortune in love, we're stuck at best. Maybe we're just panicked by ghosts of old days, still it we are.
baby Though it's not as pretty as it seems Why the long face is it that bad? was an uplifting tune. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just keep moving right along. Failure number two. <laughs> Things were getting pretty sticky in New York City. We had sunk a bunch of our money into producing a brand new musical that we wrote and starred in. Which involved aerialists and giant puppets and an onstage band. It wasn't a cheap show. Oh, I just happened to have a laminated picture of that show right here. Ooh, yeah. Pass it around. Check out how young and skinny we look. So young. So skinny. We guilted dozens of our friends into coming to see this show, and yet somehow we did not recoup the thousands and thousands of dollars we had poured into it. <laughs> Suddenly, making our rent seemed impossible. We were broke. We were trapped. Then, my best friend told me that she was moving to L.A., and I thought, I want to move to L.A. Sun, surf, beaches, avocados. We went for a visit. Droughts, fires, earthquakes, Kardashians. Hard pass. The level of self-deception it would take to think that L.A. is a place where people are supposed to live. We needed to find a place that was affordable, practical, non-life-threatening. But it needed to have a little waltz to it, you know, a little whimsy. It was hard because if you haven't noticed, we are among the world's judgiest people. <laughs> then we went to Kelly's wedding in Denver. Oh, um, this is Kelly. <laughs> we got off the plane and there was sunshine. And legal weed. We walked around downtown and noticed how many people were smiling at us and we thought, what is going on? Is everyone <laughs> high? Then, we stopped for a cone at a dairy-free ice cream Tesla. And there, yeah, and there was a hula hooping contest going on. And then a fire truck pulled up and sprayed a cool mist over the crowd and a giant rainbow appeared in the sky. Justin and I gazed into each other's eyes and whispered, Denver. <laughs> And it was at that moment that I decided we were moving to Colorado. I thought we would head back to New York and talk it over. But, <laughs> but you were wrong. Because there is a, a little man who sits at a little desk in the back of my brain. And as soon as I tell that little man that something is going to happen, he quietly gets to work. And there is no sleeping, there are no snacks, there are no breaks, there is nothing but working, working, working for that little man. The little man started applying for jobs in Colorado, and within a few weeks, he had one in Boulder with health insurance! Thank you so much. They did not find that funny in the UK. <laughs> But, uh, well, then the, the little man and I had to tell Justin what we had been up to, and, and Justin was hesitant. Pissed. But after a few discussions... Screaming fights on the subway. Uh, we decided we would go for it. Give Colorado a try, and we moved just like that. I had never even been to Boulder. I had secretly flown in for an interview. <laughs> and spent three whole hours there. It seemed picturesque. But then we realized it was very expensive to live in Boulder. And we moved into a not very picturesque ground floor apartment. And there was no more NYC, the place where you can at least pretend something interesting was happening in your life. And we were living in Boulder, a very expensive, 
Very athletic. Sea of white college kids vaping. But it was too late. We had already packed up all our problems from New York and moved them out west, along with a giant Bigfoot puppet from our failed aerial musical. And it lived under our bed. Literally, a monster lived under our bed in Boulder. Wherever you go, there you are. We can see it in the skyline. We can go and have a visit. We don't live there. We don't live there. And our eyes are filled with anxious, heaving visions of the light. We don't live there. We don't live there. It was never our birthright to have things and no fight. It was always part of a plan to go out west like a young man. We can see it in the skyline. We can go and have a visit. We don't live there. We don't live there. And our eyes are filled with anxious, heaving visions of the light. We don't live there. We don't live there, and we crawl through the sprawl, and we cling into our dreams, and the past, and the things that we hope it might mean, and the stories we tell are of how much we love, how it was, how it never was, oh, how it never was. takes care of getting married for terrible reasons, going broke in New York City, and accidentally moving to Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. This brings us to failure number four. <laughs> Trashing our dreams of being artists and settling for office jobs. <laughs> well, Stephanie, <laughs> would you like to go first? I would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know... The only thing I've ever wanted to be in my life is an artist. <laughs> bam, bam, oh, bam, that's for you. No, <laughs> Justin, let's just take it from the top of that part, okay? <laughs> you know, the only thing I've ever wanted to be in my life is an artist. <laughs> I took a bus from Nebraska to New York City at 18 years old with $100 cash in my pocket. No cell phone, no credit card, just the address of a theater written on a piece of paper. I went to that theater for an internship and learned how to pick up lunches for people with dietary restrictions. And for years and years after that, I worked in the theater. I was cast in plays all over the country and I performed in Europe and I once helped John Lithgow pick out a lipstick at a Rite Aid. <laughs> but my real claim to fame was that at a VIP Broadway party, I once told Arthur Miller, the, uh, the famous American playwright, he wrote, yes, you know who he is, yes, okay. Well, I once told him that I was pretty sure Arthur Miller was dead. <laughs> so, 
Like most people actively failing out of their careers, I decided to go to grad school. I auditioned at the Yale School of Drama and got called back. Lupita Nyong'o was in that final callback. You know her, right? She won an Oscar. She was in Black Panther, yeah? A lot of other people were in that callback, too, who aren't that famous, but they are on TV. <laughs> anyway. When it was all over, I took the train back to the city with a bunch of the other actors, and we all congratulated ourselves on the fact that we had killed at that audition, and we were absolutely getting into Yale. And uh, we were mostly right. They all got in, and I got a day job with free coffee and nice bathrooms to cry in. <laughs> And eventually, I grew utterly exhausted with the whole damn thing. I just want to be drunk and really profoundly thank you. I just want to be left alone. I just want to dig a hole that leads to China. Go to the place where nobody can find you. Bury myself. Just like a bone, I got weapons of mass destruction against you, darling. Inspectors come and I beg their pardon. Lock me up, put the mat under the key. Oh, you could find me. La -da -da -da. La -da 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 you look high, baby, but you look so low. You look at me and I think you had to go. I say you're so, so late. You don't know where I might be. My body's in a sub sub basement. My heart's in a small town. My soul's in the bath and my mind's not found. But I'm all wrapped up in a soundproof tapestry. Don't try to find me. with you on the side of the story. <laughs> Let's turn the spotlight over to Justin. Justin, why don't you tell all these nice people how your artistic dreams fell apart? Well, I wouldn't say fell apart. <laughs> My first acting role was as an Oompa Loompa in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I loved it because I was damn good at it. And as a child of divorce, lost in a sea of step-siblings, I really needed the attention. I found it on the stage, and it was delicious. I wanted to grow up to be 
Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman, a handsome, talented man in the movies and on Broadway. That's who I wanted to be. And I got into grad school at Columbia University, an Ivy League grad school, Columbia University. I studied hard and took my MFA and for years used it to work as a bartender. <laughs> then my ship finally came in when I was cast in Hair on Broadway. <laughs> and everything was going great until I missed one rehearsal. And at that rehearsal, they blocked the number where all of the hippies get naked. You know this? You seen Hair? By well, the end of the first act, right before intermission, everyone gets naked. Now, since I wasn't there to protest, I was chosen to take my pants off first, walk, in a slow, naked circle, and then lie down center stage, spread eagle. Oh, I was really hoping that my parents would be able to come and see this show and actually feel proud of me. But no, you see, one night in front of a sold out Broadway house, I jerked my pants off really hard and my back went out. I laid down on the ground and realized I wasn't getting back up again. The rest of the naked hippies all pranced off stage, and I was left there, naked and afraid. <laughs> and the last minute, someone came and dragged me off into the wings, but I was really hurt. And the stage manager came up to me and said, you'd better get your act together, because there's a long line of actors waiting at the door, ready to replace you. And I knew she wasn't lying, but what could I do? My back got worse, and the show closed early. And, um... That's the whole story about you performing on Broadway? Uh, now, I, I, I know, I was acting a little full of myself, oh but my God. this was Broadway for my first time. It was a big deal. He kept telling his out of work actor friends how he didn't want to do musicals when he was in a Broadway musical. Well, I was <laughs> ambitious. I didn't want a career as a chorus boy. I almost broke up with him every day he was in that show. And yet, for some reason, you kept coming back for more. Well, you're very lucky you're good looking. Believe me, I know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I stopped auditioning for Broadway and I got myself an office job while my back healed. <laughs> But I've never given up on my dream. There's still a chance that I'm gonna find fame a little later on in life. Just like Hugh Jackman. <laughs> Well, we were born when we were born, and we were raised how we were raised. We came wired in certain ways so we could face uncertain days. Uncertain days. Uncertain days. We were born before the time that kids revealed their hearts online. Made no records of our crime. We just ran free, and that was fine. And that was fine. And that was fine. who always swim when we're pushed in. We have our fight, we have our friends when we're pushed in. Justin, do you want to do the dance? Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much, that's my choreography. Out of the love songs of light the great musicians die. So let your love light shine, 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 shine. Telling you there is no other time. No other time. We are the kids who always swim. When we're pushed in, we have our fights, we have our friends. When we're pushed in, we are the kids who always swim. So, we 
with our wounded egos and our mutually failing acting careers, we found ourselves in our new life in Boulder. Ah, uh, this leads us to failure number five. We didn't fit in in Boulder. <laughs> Now, during our first month there, we went for a springtime hike, and it was really muddy, like disgustingly <laughs> muddy. We had to tiptoe <laughs> along the edge of the path. And that's when Boulder Jesus appeared, walking beside us in Tevas with his hands clasped behind his back, and he said... Hey, guys. You really have to walk in the mud. I know it's a bummer, but these paths are wide enough already. I'm sorry, I'm just a conservationist. <laughs> we were both mad, but Justin was so mad. <laughs> we will be 80 years old and Justin will shake his cane in rage and yell, fuck you, Boulder Jesus. Fuck that guy. Boulder Jesus is everywhere. <laughs> like, Justin and I started attending a primal yoga class on Sunday mornings. Mm, it was very primal. <laughs> well, we both kind of wanted to make out with the teacher. Well, he, was a, he was a very primal sort of man. <laughs> but like in a straight way, though, like Hugh Jackman. <laughs> anyway, so we go to this tree of trust group at Yoga Man's house, and he starts out the conversation with this really heartfelt testimony about his addictions and struggles, like serious stuff, you know? And then he opens it up to the group for everyone to share their serious problems. And one yogi says... Something I'm really struggling with lately is how to grasp which whole foods are truly sustainable, you know? Like, should I be eating local? Should I be eating raw? I just want to do what's best for the planet, and it really bothers me. Yeah, I totally feel you specifically from my heart chakra. So what I want to vocalize is that I don't even know how to buy clothing anymore because I don't have a clear concept of where cotton comes from. Boulder Jesus. Boulder Jesus. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's just spreading white people nonsense all over the place. Now, on the plus side of living in Boulder, we were able to get a hold of nature's medicine, good old Colorado weed. Back in New York City, we bought our weed out of a Starbucks bathroom. But in Boulder, <laughs> we bought our weed out of a store. From a kid who looked like he had a good childhood. And then we tried mushrooms, and it was great. It helped us remember how much we love each other. And it helped us remember that the earth is full of dead people's bones. We were so high. And we felt so good about everything for four whole hours. But can we tell just one more story to make fun of Boulder? Oh, totally, please, okay, yeah. Okay, so I treated Justin to what was advertised as a tarot card reading in the basement of a spiritual bookstore. We sit down across from this woman and she gazes <gasps> deeply into my eyes. You have an animal that's very important to you. Yes, we do. Yes, you have a cat? Nope. You have a dog? Yes. Yes? Yes, you have a big dog. No. You have a little dog? Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, and he has perky little ears. No. He has floppy long yes. ears. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, and he's white. No. Black? Nope. Brown? Bingo! Yes. Well, the spirits are telling me he's just here to help. <laughs> he is so not here to help. He's, he's here to bully our neighbor's dogs and hump our friends. <laughs> Here I have a picture. <laughs> I know. This dog is my fault. <laughs> I actually demanded this dog as soon as we got to Boulder. I said, I'm not gonna live in fucking Boulder without a fucking dog. Verbatim. But I didn't want just any dog. I wanted a teeny little purebred Havanese, the national dog of Cuba. Now, I know it's not very popular to have a purebred dog, and you can all feel free to judge me, because karma's way ahead of you. 
My teeny little purebred Havanese has serious psychological and behavioral issues. Now, we did take him to see a trainer. Yes, that did not work. Not one bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, right after we rescued our pup from the upscale breeders, he got a bad case of Giardia. And it was around this time that I began to realize I am not terribly fit to become the mother of a human. No caretaking instincts whatsoever. The dog does one gross thing and part of me just turns black and falls off. <laughs> Plus with Justin's temper, I oh, mean. Oh, totally. With the amount of times that I have completely lost it on the phone with a customer care representative, there is no reason I should ever live with a child. <laughs> <laughs> and this brings us to failure number six. We forgot to have kids. Now, I guess you can't technically call this a failure because we didn't even try, but it definitely feels like a failure because people are always telling me that having kids is the most amazing thing they've ever done. And I won't even know what love is until I have one. People are telling me that. Me. Do you know who they never say that to? Nobody ever says that to me. I know. People have even told me I'm too naturally nurturing not to have kids. That's funny. Who said that? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but for someone who doesn't know what love is, there are a lot of things I love. I love watching television. <laughs> I love eating dinner. <laughs> I love performing at Tony Award-winning Cabaret Club! <laughs> and if loving all of that is wrong, baby, I don't want to be right. <laughs> slow us down and we all know what happens fast but I drink the madman's elixir and I'm gonna make my good looks last la di da di da la di da di di everybody wants a baby except me oh no I like my nest empty La -de -da -de -de. Come to my house, friend. You will see it's clean and I'm fast asleep. <laughs> Justin. Yes, Stephanie? You want to see me uh, do the shake? <laughs> I sure do. Oh, okay. Nice and slow. I'm a 
Well, it's fun to do on an accordion. You should never do it to a baby. In conclusion, I married a man. And I'm sure that the boys work fine. But I know our glitches, and I don't need to see his jeans when they're mixed with mine. Maybe I'm fooling myself, and I'll rue it when I'm gray. But I'm just a cricket who sang all summer, and I'll dance on the last of my fertile days. la di da di da la di da di di Everybody wants a baby except me. Oh no, I like my nest and tea. La di da di da, la di da di di. Come to my house and you will see it's clean and fast asleep. The run songs about three. Not for me. So we moved to Boulder, and Stephanie started a new impressive career at the university. As a receptionist. And I spent a little quality time really finding myself. Well, you couldn't really find a job. <laughs> this wasn't an easy time for me. My brain turned on me all of a sudden. You've ruined your life, it said. You were an actor on Broadway, and now you're nothing. You're wasting your God-given talent. And most loudly, my brain started to say that this was all Stephanie's fault. He got so mad. <laughs> and every time I simply tried to express my feelings to Stephanie, I noticed that the neighbors would start pounding on the wall. They even called the cops on me one night. And the, the Boulder police showed up to arrest me for domestic disturbance, which I thought seemed a little extreme. They even brought in backup because my voice is so <laughs> strong and resonant. <laughs> With all my Shakespearean training, they truly thought I was trying to murder my wife. <laughs> The Boulder police told me that I needed to immediately get myself away from this vocally gifted man. <laughs> but instead of listening to them, I talked them out of arresting Justin. Well. Actually, the fact that we are white people mostly talk them out of arresting Justin. This is true, and, and it leads us to failure number seven. I received several mental health diagnoses and did my very best to ignore them all. <laughs> now, this failure is really all you, honey. I love my mental health diagnosis. <laughs> I have medication-resistant major depression disorder, which I know sounds bad, but... As a firstborn perfectionist, it really helps me get comfortable with consistently disappointing my friends and family. <laughs> Plus, I love talking to my best friend, who I pay, who is my therapist. I, on the other hand, did not embrace my mental health journey. Now, it's uh, pretty clear from a very early age that there was something different about the way my brain worked especially after my parents got divorced and my mom remarried a guy who already had kids and I went from being the baby of two to the middle child of five and I was pissed. So I started throwing tantrums every day at school. If anyone even looked at me, I stormed out of my second grade classroom one day and screamed at my teacher that I was going back to kindergarten. This is the last time I can remember feeling happy. Mm. You know, and it got so bad that uh, she had to make a chart for me to take home to my mom at night. And if I had thrown a tantrum, she'd put a black X in the box. But if I'd been good, mm, if I'd been good, she'd put in a gold star. I didn't get many gold stars. 
You know what, Steph? I feel a montage coming on. Oh, don't you just love a montage? <laughs> Consequences. In my early 20s, I started having extreme panic attacks. So I went to a doctor and they diagnosed me with a panic disorder and they gave me Zoloft. But then my health insurance ran out, so I stopped taking it. But the panic attacks came back. So I went to another doctor for meds and they told me that I had bipolar disorder, which I immediately disregarded as fucking ridiculous. So I went to another doctor for meds and they gave me Klonopin. Oh, 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 better fear that. Oh, 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 no one else ever saw them. I denied this behavior to our therapist, who believed me. Well, you are very good at acting. Well, I, I do have an advanced degree in pretending. Which is very confusing in a therapeutic context. Yeah, I, honestly, I am kind of like therapist bait. Yeah. <laughs> Next, I was diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, which is a lot like bipolar, but way more explosive. On a mood stabilizer called Depakote, I gained 10 pounds, couldn't orgasm, and the rage attacks continued. Oh, 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 so we upped my Depakote, added an antidepressant called Vibrid, and I got a sexy new side effect, violent leg spasms. <laughs> so, overweight, undersexed, and incredibly twitchy, I was finally diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which is not treated with medication. So I went off the pills, started dialectic behavioral therapy, and now everything in my life is completely perfect. Do you fear the consequences? Do you fear the consequences? You better fear the consequences. Do you fear the consequences? Do you Completely perfect is a, a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I still have about two or three serious breakdowns a year, and every time it happens, it's kind of the same song and dance. I lose my shit over something, or absolutely nothing. I kick him out of the house. I get seethingly angry at her for a few days until I bottom out and find myself completely hopeless and ashamed. And then I spin out into a depression. And then I can help. I comfort her and make her feel better. I take his credit card and buy myself things. <laughs> like these pants. Aren't they cute? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I get back to my protocols and everything starts to feel normal again. Yeah. So overall, we're talking about 10... 15 really bad days a year. Yeah, and the rest of the time, things aren't so bad. He isn't an asshole. He has a mood disorder. <laughs> now, when these things happen, I do tend to get pretty depressed. I, I can't sleep, I can't digest food, and the diarrhea. Okay, I don't think we need to share all the details. Listen, I am an out and proud IBS sufferer. I will not be silent. Sure, but like we just said, things aren't so bad now. I know, but you try saying that when the person you live with screams at you. I mean, screams at you. Like, I deserve a fucking medal for staying with you all these years. Even the dog is traumatized. Don't bring the fucking dog into this! Don't bring the fucking dog into this! Every single fucking time, just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. 
Well, I guess we're having a bad day then. <laughs> Don't worry, folks. He'll be back in a minute, and we're just going to, you know, we're just going to, you know, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to sing something snappy. <laughs> we're gonna do. <laughs> you know, when these things happen, I just have to dig down deep into my coping mechanisms. You know, I take some deep breaths, and I center myself, or maybe I go for a walk, or... Uh, do some yoga. You know, even with all of that, I, I do tend to get a little blue. Um, well, my, my therapist told me that the depression is rooted in the fact that I basically married my family. <laughs> Growing up, they all had what they called the hillbilly temper. They didn't drink, but they were angry sobers. Plus, they were Pentecostal Christians, so there was a lot of speaking in tongues, miracle healings, demon possession, stuff like that. And then my freshman year of college, they found out I was dating a girl, so they pulled me out of school and sent me to the family exorcist, <laughs> which did not clarify my teenage sexuality, but it did send me straight to therapy. I started at about 19 years old, and I never stopped. Um, but the, uh, the therapy only helped to a certain point. You know, like I could talk very clearly about my problems, but I still felt like shit. And then after five or six antidepressants, which did not work, my doctor in Boulder told me that I should try acupuncture, which is precisely how a doctor in Boulder says, yeah, I don't fucking know. <laughs> You know, I even called the suicide hotline one night, and after waiting on hold for 45 minutes, they hung up on me. Oh, yes. Um, so I, uh, well, okay, I had to go on this trip for my job, and the night before I left, Justin had, um, <laughs> you know, and then I worked three 18-hour days in a row on an event that I cared nothing about. And then on my way back to my hotel room, I just stopped at the ATM and took out $1,000 cash, you know, like, like kind of in a trance, you know. I took out the money, and I put it in an envelope, and I wrote a note to the cleaning staff at the hotel telling them what they were going to find in the bathroom. And then I just got real calm, and I poured a bath, and I laid out all the supplies that I was going to need, and then I got into the bath, and I just started thinking about this show I'd been watching the night before. Um, it's called Shrill. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah? Okay, so it was the episode where A.D. Bryant goes to the pool party? Yeah? Okay, okay. And I just thought, God, I wonder what she's going to do next. And I don't know. <laughs> Somehow that was enough. I got out of the bathtub and watched some episodes and woke up the next morning. So that suicide attempt was prevented by Hulu. So <laughs> thank you, Hulu. <laughs> well, that was a little heavy, huh? Maybe just uh, just a. Mm -hmm. I have heard that this is very good for depression, yeah? <laughs> you know, I did find some relief on a treatment called ketamine. Yeah, okay, you've heard of it. Yeah. So my doctor prescribes these little ketamine lozenges that I can pop under my tongue if I start to feel a little blue so I can throw myself a dissociative party that I like to call the ketamine happy hour. The world is too grim for vodka. The news is too bad for champagne. Don't offer me marijuana. I need more than that little flame. Oh. <laughs> I need 
need ketamine. I really mean it. It's a vice for pandemic times. I take my medicine. It helps me unwind. It melts my polar ice caps. And the water's just fine. I wait till five o'clock. I'm a classy gal. Then I turn to my prescription to boost my morale. Ketamine, happy hour. Ooh. Slip me under your tongue. Ketamine, happy hour. Ooh. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Life is short, but the trip is long. Who can say what's right or wrong? But I plan to sing along at the ketamine happy hour. If I could offer advice, to all of humanity. I'd say find yourself a prescriber. Hold on to your sanity. You need ketamine. Yeah, I really mean it. It's a savior straight from the lab. It's not going to cure the virus. It won't heal the lamb. It's not gonna stop injustice, but it stops me from being a crab. You can try it at a clinic through an IV. You can get it in the mail. Just don't do it while you watch TV. Ketamine, happy hour. Ooh. Slip me under your tongue. Ketamine, happy hour. Ooh. Let's have some fun, fun, fun. Life is short, but the trip is long. Who can say what's right or wrong? But let's all sing along at the Academy Happy Hour. You can grab a date and dissociate my anesthesia. Is on the guest list at the Academy. Happy hour. Well, look who's finally ready to rejoin the group. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't worry, I'll get your credit card later. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I am trying. Yeah. Um, sometimes I don't even know why you stay married to me. Well, I, I hate meeting new people. You, you know, I, um, I knew from the first night that we kissed that I was going to marry you. Well, what can I say? I am marriage material. No, no, no. You, you are. I, I even went out and told my drunken friends that night that I was going to marry you. <laughs> Look, um, here's proof. I wrote it on a napkin and signed it. Uh, well, you weren't wrong. You did marry me, and here we are ten years later. Sometimes it takes a whole lot of therapy and a long string of prescription psychotropics to make a marriage work. All this time, I've just been a depressed girl standing in front of an improperly diagnosed boy with a mood disorder, asking him to love her. You com complete me. Well, that's all the failure we no, have no, for no, you no, today, no. folks. Thank you so much. We, we got to wrap romantic. it up. It's about our first we, night together. It's about my feelings for her, and she wrote it. We don't have time. We, Please. Are you okay? You, uh, 
sit there and let me serenade you in your own words. <laughs> Fire escape After a long night Pure heaven Another cigarette And we watch the kids Get kicked out of Abingdon The sun came up But we weren't done With each other yet I should have known then I should have realized The pain that you had locked up Behind your eyes I should have let go I should have walked away But I was young And a little drunk And it looks like I stayed Do you think the gravity here is stronger than the gravity anywhere in this whole world. I would sit upon this stone and wait for you like a mother waits for a birth. My when you called me your star Lucky for me This gravity won't let me get too far Sit with me, baby Let the wind make us who we are sit upon this stone and wait for you like a mother waits for a birth. My heart exploded when you called me your star. Lucky for me, this 
Miss Gravity won't let me get too far. Sit with me, baby, let the wind make us who we are. Sit with me, baby, let the wind make us who we are. Sit with me, baby, let the wind make us who we See you.